Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Good. All right. It's good to be together. I got some claps. Y'all doing real good. You can clap. God's good, right? I want to welcome those of you who are uh, new to our church and everybody watching from our different uh, locations and those of you watching online. Uh, I'm excited to dive into God's Word this morning. We're going to be in Mark 8. And if you're new to our church, we have been in a series called Following Jesus where we're studying the Gospel of Mark. And we're going to pick up where we left off in Mark chapter 8. Now, let me just um, start with this. Uh, one of the most Googled questions, period, is what does God want me to do with my life? Some of you have Googled it. That's not the best way to find that answer. Uh, but it is one of the most Googled questions. What does God want me to do with my life? And some of you may be wrestling with that question. It's a question that, that you don't just answer it and you're done. Like that question comes up in different seasons and different circumstances. And I don't plan to answer that question for you today. I'm sorry. I don't necessarily plan to answer the question, what does God want you to do with your life? But I do hope to help you rethink how you see your life in general. And here's specifically what I want to do. I want to convince you that God has called you to ministry. Now, some of you got nervous partly because you've been actually wrestling with a call to ministry. You've been running away from it like Jonah, and you didn't expect that today God was going to come for your life. But you need to surrender. All right, that's for you. For everybody else, when I talk about ministry, I'm not necessarily talking about ministry in the way we tend to talk about it today. Ministry does not just mean professional clergy. It doesn't even just mean serving in a particular church program, although there's lots of opportunities for you to minister in that way here and at all of our locations. If you're taking notes just up top, listen, here's the definition of ministry. Ministry is serving people in Jesus' name. Ministry is serving people on behalf of Jesus. Let me say it again so it sinks in. Ministry is serving people on behalf of Jesus. Amen. That's what makes it distinctively Christian. That's what ministry is. And you can do that in so many ways. In fact, you are doing that in so many ways. This is why some of you are in the career field that you're in. It's, it's, it's what you do in your homes. It's what you do in, in community. Ministry is just serving people on behalf of Jesus. And that's why I say I don't necessarily want to tell you what God wants you to do with your life, but I want you to think about your life differently. What if you thought about your job differently? What if you thought about your parenting differently? What if you thought about your life differently? That as a follower of Jesus, and if you're not here, if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, you're watching, then I hope you will hear very clearly here this invitation from Jesus to your heart. But what if you saw your life as an opportunity to serve people on behalf of Jesus? And so this is the question I want you to wrestle with. Who's God calling you to minister to? Who is God calling you to minister to? So I want to read Mark chapter 8, verses 1 through 10, and then we'll, we'll dive, dive into what God has to say to us here. Mark chapter 8, verse 1 it says, In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd because they've been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come from far away. And his disciples answered him, Jesus, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, how many loaves do you have? They said, seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and, and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a, sm a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up the broken pieces left over, seven baskets full. 
And there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away. And immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We know, God, that your word does not return void. It accomplishes everything that you send it forth to accomplish. Lord, I pray that, that you would call people in specific ways through your word today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want you to remember the context, and if you haven't been tracking with us in this series or reading through the Gospel of Mark with us, uh, I want to catch you up on the context uh, because it's important that you understand what's been happening right before this. So Jesus has been traveling with his disciples outside of Israel. And now in Mark chapter 8, he's in a Gentile region called the Decapolis. We looked at this last week. The Decapolis was uh, this collection, this region that's a collection of about 10 cities that uh, it, it was southeast of the Sea of Galilee, and it's a Gentile region. And word about Jesus has spread so far and so fast that droves of people are coming to see him from all over the region. In fact, one of the uh, other gospel accounts, uh, Matthew, who was, who was traveling with Jesus at the time, he summarized what was happening uh, at that time in that region. Mark chapter 15, verse 30. We looked at this last week. Mark chapter 15, verse 30, it says, And large crowds came to Jesus, including the lame, the blind, the crippled, those unable to speak, and many others. And they put all of these people at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. So you can imagine it was a pretty crazy and chaotic time. Uh, in fact, the crowds weren't just gathering, they were camping out in the middle of nowhere for like three days. This is how we used to do back in the day. I went to University of Maryland, Go Terps, College Park. This is like this generation is spoiled. They got technology. Back in the day, if we wanted to go to a Duke game, which is a whole other thing. We're not in the ACC no more. I'm heartbroken. But whatever. Back in the day, when you wanted to go to a Duke game, you literally had to camp out, like outside Coalfield House at the time, in order to get Duke tickets and we did it. It didn't matter if it was final time. It didn't matter what we had to do. We camped out outside. So you can imagine like this crowd that has been gathering and building more and more and more as people hear about where Jesus is. The crowd is getting bigger. Day one, day two, day three, people have been camping out for three days waiting for healing. Some people, they didn't need healing, but they are just there just watching the spectacle of it all. They're, they're watching this, what they saw as this Jewish miracle worker do all of these miracles. They're, they're just watching in awe. But there's a problem. And that's where we pick it up in Mark chapter 8, verse 1. And the problem is this crowd is hungry. And it says Jesus had compassion. Now, we've talked about this word compassion before, but in the original language, it comes from a word that means bowels or intestines, which I know sounds very weird, right? But it's not that weird actually when you think about it because we use a lot of the same imagery today. Think about it. We use that imagery when we talk about seeing something that was gut-wrenching. Like this was a way of describing the deep pain you feel when you see somebody else in pain, when you feel something deep down to your core. And that's what Jesus experiences when he sees this crowd. The crowd has been camping out for three days. They're getting hungry, and they don't have any food. Now, there's two types of people in the world. There's people in the world who are always prepared, and then there's people who depend on the people who are already prepared, right? Right? So there's some of y'all that are prepared for anything, anything. I remember, I don't even remember who, who she was, because if I did, I know I would say her name. But I, just somebody uh, that, that I was in a group, Bible study, I don't remember, but she was sharing. She was being vulnerable, right? She didn't know that I was going to use her story. But she was just sharing how when she was young, her mom used to make her breakfast every morning, and she was, used to put bacon in her pocket. 
like leftover bacon in her pocket just so she was always prepared. She had bacon on the way to the bus stop. She had bacon in, in, in the hallways at, at school. Like kids, that is a pro tip, all right? It's a little greasy, but whatever. She was always prepared. And some of y'all are laughing, but some of y'all are doing it. Some of y'all are doing it right now. You got stuff in your purse that don't belong in your purse. You know what I mean? You got Splenda. You got all kinds of stuff in your purse. Growing up, my mom may or may not have always had hot sauce in her purse. I don't know. You just always want to be prepared. Apparently, this crowd did not get that memo. They didn't get the memo. They're so caught up in the hype that they haven't really thought about how they're going to eat, which doesn't seem like a big deal in the grand scheme of things. I mean, think about the people that Jesus has ministered to up to this point. Like we've been, Mark chapter 1 through 7, just think about the people that Jesus has ministered to, people who are demon-possessed, people who need to be healed of very severe disabilities and diseases that we've just finished looking at. Jesus has been constantly bombarded by hurting people in desperate need. And yet, listen, Jesus is moved by the fact that this crowd needs a snack. And I don't want us to just rush by that. Because some of us need to allow that to sink in. That God cares about what you're concerned about. God cares about the little things, right, that you're concerned. Because notice in verse 3, it's not even that they're going to die. Like, he's just concerned that they'll get a little lightheaded, that they might faint. And you can imagine the crowd kind of being like, okay, I mean, I feel a little lightheaded, Jesus, but there's all these people that are waiting in line to be healed. Jesus has compassion because they're hungry. And some of us need to hear that because we believe that God is compassionate in general, but we struggle to actually believe that he's concerned, that he actually is, is, he, he feels the weight of the things that are actually weighing us down. We have a hard time imagining that God feels compassion toward us in the particular challenges that we're facing. And listen, I want you to hear this loud and clear. This crowd is not Christians. So if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, I want you to see this in the text, that God loves you so much, he's so gracious, that he actually cares about the stuff going on in your life. He's not waiting for you to get everything right. He's not even waiting for you to believe in him yet as he's revealed himself in Scripture. But he cares about the things that concern you. Here's how this plays out. In our thoughts. Like for the people that need to hear this, that struggle with this, this is how this plays out. And this is like, how, this is the, the loop that goes on in your mind, right? You think there's, there's, oh, there's billions of people who don't have access to the gospel. Does God really care about my final exams? Do you really care about my college applications? There's children right now who are dying from malnutrition, like literally dying from hunger. Does God really care about my dating problems? Does he really care about my back pain? Does he really care about the fact that I have trouble sleeping? I mean, come on, in the grand scheme of things, that's really not that big of a deal. There's so many other things that God would be concerned about that he wouldn't be concerned about the fact that I'm just up at night. And yes, it is healthy to keep our problems in perspective. But if that's the way you think, If you think God's compassion is a zero-sum game, if you think that his compassion is only activated by more serious problems, let me say this to you, then you are actually belittling God's character and his capacity and the depth of his love for you. Here's why. Because God's compassion is not a finite resource. It's not like he's, he's so consumed being compassionate about all these big things that that just drains all the compassion and there's none left for the things that you assume are just so small and little to him. 
Psalm 116 verse 5 says, The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. And so listen, it's not the size of the problem that activates God's compassion. God has compassion because he's compassionate. It's not the size of the problem. It's the effect that the problem is having on you. That is enough for him to be moved with compassion. Because listen, a lack of food is not a big deal to God. We just saw that it's not a big deal to him at all. But Jesus still felt compassion for the crowd simply because they were hungry. He sees their need. He feels compassion for them. And then, and this is important, listen, then he brings that need to his disciples' attention. And this is exactly how calling works. This is how calling works. Jesus sees the need. He's filled with compassion. And then he says to his disciples, I need you to pay attention to this need as well. This is where ministry begins. It begins with God showing you a need, making you aware of how he wants to use you to meet that need. Listen, what needs has God made you aware of? What problems has he shown you that need to be solved? What people does he keep highlighting that need to be ministered to? Listen, this is why some of you, like I said, are in the career that you're in. Because God showed you a need. He showed you a problem that needs to be solved. This is why some of you put your career on pause. Because God showed you a need in your home with your children. And he's called you to do ministry in the life of your child or in your children, in your home. This is a crowd without enough food, but maybe for you it's a crowd without enough education. Maybe it's a crowd without a mom and a dad. Maybe it's a crowd without hope because of their depression or addiction or abuse. A crowd that all of us should feel God's compassion for, those without the gospel. God sees the need and then he draws your attention to it. Now listen, there's certain needs or people in need that you might instinctively feel compassion for. And usually that's connected to your background. So maybe because of your own personal experience, something that you went through, something that was painful and challenging for you, or something that that you watched somebody that you love go through. And so your personal experience or or that personal exposure, like it gives you just a, a, a soft spot in your heart for people who are going through that same thing. Or maybe you've developed a unique sense of compassion for certain people because of your education and your training. Because of your background, there are certain needs and people in need that you just naturally, instinctively feel compassion toward. And you should pay attention to that. But there's other needs in people in need that you may not instinctively feel compassion toward. You might not even be aware of the need until God puts those people or that need on your radar. Now, can I be honest with you? Y'all really leaving me hanging. I'm, I'm, that's my introduction to being vulnerable, okay? Help me. Can I be honest with y'all? Okay. So, growing up, Global missions and and unreached people groups, it wasn't like a major emphasis for me. I mean, I knew about, I mean, I knew there was a thing called missions and every once in a while there'd be a missionary or something like that, but it it wasn't a huge emphasis like for me and my life. And over time as I'm studying the Bible and I got a master of divinity, so I had to study that stuff, you know, for my theology degree and all that type of stuff. So yeah, I I was aware and I began to, to see God's heart for the nations like in different parts of scripture, whatever. But, but uh, can I be, like, super honest? Yeah. This is a safe, safe space? Yeah, I need to hear from y'all at the low stage too. Can I be honest? Okay. So, so, so when I first started listening to David's preaching, this is way before he ever came to McLean Bible Church. When I first started listening to his preaching, and I would hear, like, come on, y'all have seen it, like, the pain, right, that, that, that is just expressed when he talks about those who do not have access to the gospel. I'll be honest, it was kind of jarring to me. And 
And God used him, in addition to my own study of Scripture and other people, to begin to like awaken not just my intellect, but my heart to this urgent need of the gospel for people who don't have access to it. And so when David came here to McLean Bible Church, I started praying two specific prayers. One of them was, God, would you, would you deepen my heart and my compassion for people around the world who don't have access to the gospel? And he's been faithful to answer that prayer. This is what you see happening over and over again with the disciples. Like this is what you see happening. Part of their discipleship, part of their spiritual maturity is growing in compassion for the people Jesus has compassion for. I mean, listen, Compassion 101 was core curriculum in Jesus' discipleship program. He was not just teaching them things to know. He was teaching them how to feel. He was teaching them to actually have compassion for the people that he has compassion for. They had to learn to show God's compassion toward tax collectors and sinners. They had to learn to show God's compassion toward people with leprosy, people under demonic oppression. They had to learn how to show God's compassion toward Roman soldiers and even children to see them as little people made in the image of God instead of inconvenience. And so, listen, whether it's a compassion that you just instinctively have or a compassion that God has to develop in you gradually, this is where your ministry begins. God makes you aware of a need and begins to down, listen, he begins to download his compassion into your heart for those people who are dealing with that need. And listen, some of you have been ignoring or delaying that prompting from the Lord. Maybe even just outright resisting it. where that particular need or those needs, it it doesn't show up on everybody's radar in the exact same way, but it's on your radar. And he's been highlighting that need, and he's been showing you that that, that person or those people, and you've been hearing the announcements over and over again, and you know that that's something that seems like God might want you to look into, but you've been ignoring it or you've been delaying it or you may even be outright resisting it for whatever reason. Maybe you're too busy. Maybe it doesn't line up with your plans. And to the extent that you ignore or delay or resist that prompting from the Lord in your heart, you are missing out on God's invitation to step into the adventure. Missing out on God's invitation to step into what he's calling you into, to partner with him, to join him to get underneath the burden that he feels and to allow that compassion to pour over into your heart. Listen, what need is God putting on your radar? What burden is God putting on your heart? What is that thing that the Lord has been leading you to do? Who is that person that God's been leading you to reach out to? What's that group that he's called you to step up and lead? What's that ministry he's called you to get involved in? What's that business he's called you to start? Or at least how is he asking you to rethink your business, to rethink what you do from nine to five? Because he's called you to ministry, to serve people on behalf of Jesus. Jesus calls his disciples aside, and he said, these people need food. And then his disciples respond in verse 4, and they say, okay, Jesus, but how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? Now, listen, we had my son's fifth birthday party at my house yesterday, and I asked Jesus this same question. (laughs) How are we going to feed these kids, Jesus? Disciples are like, Jesus, how how are we going to do what you've called us to do with the limited resources that we have? And some of you have felt that way. Some of you feel that way now. Maybe that's the thing that's been keeping you 
from stepping into what God's calling you to. Because as Mark points out in verse 9, it's a crowd of 4,000 people. 4,000 people. So we're going to talk about this more in detail in just, in just a little bit. But if you're familiar with the Bible, you know that this is actually the second time Jesus and the disciples are in this situation. It's like basically the same situation. It's a huge crowd that doesn't have food except a few loaves of bread and, and a couple of fish. That's why we already know what Jesus is going to do because he, he already did it in Mark chapter 6. And the disciples basically had the same response the first time. So if the disciples had already seen Jesus multiply bread and fish and miraculously feed thousands of people, then why did they so easily forget how powerful Jesus is? Well, let me ask you, why do you so easily forget how powerful Jesus is? Like, isn't it so easy when we're confronted with our overwhelming inadequacy to forget how powerful Jesus is? To be so focused on our limitations and our weakness that, that God actually just is no longer even in the picture? There's no way they, like, forgot that Jesus had done this two chapters ago. But they weren't thinking in chapters, but you know what I'm saying? Like, there's no way they forgot Jesus had, like, just previously done this. But instead of them saying, Jesus did it before, so I'll trust him to do it again, they said, Jesus did it before, but why should I expect him to do it again? The problem wasn't that they felt inadequate. The problem was that they allowed their inadequacy to be the whole story. They couldn't see beyond their limitations, but listen, God isn't limited by your limitations. Amen. That's good news for somebody. God is not limited by your limitations. Your inadequacy is not a problem for God. Your inadequacy is actually a prerequisite for you to be used by God. And here's why. Because it drives you to depend on him. And that sets the stage for God to glorify himself through you. And that's what we see here. Verse 5, he asked the disciples, well, how many loaves do you have? And they said seven. He directed the crowd to sit down on the ground, and they took seven loaves. And I love that they had to give it to Jesus first. To surrender what they had to Jesus first. To relinquish the plans that they had for it. They didn't wake up in the morning when they packed their lunch thinking, we about to feed 4,000 people. But they had to relinquish their plans to Jesus first. And so Jesus took the bread and having given thanks, he broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd and they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And that line in the middle of verse 6 ministered to me so much this week that he took the seven loaves and it says, and he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. They gave it to Jesus. They put it in his hands because there's no way for them to meet that need in their own strength. They give it to him. And guess what? He gives it right back, not just to them, but through them. They become his instruments to do something bigger than they could have done, bigger than they had planned for, bigger than they could have even imagined. Now, I want to show you something as we prepare to, to I want to show you something that you can't really see if you're just casually reading this. 
Like, you got to read this. This is why it's important to actually know how to study the Bible, to read the Bible in context, because you're not going to see this unless you read this in the overall context of Mark's gospel, because they didn't really realize it at the time. But Jesus had invited them to participate in something bigger than they could have imagined. Now, let me show you what I, what I mean. Chances are you're already familiar with this story. Maybe not all the details, but it's one of the most well-known stories in the Bible. And so even if you're new to church, maybe you, you, you haven't really read the Bible a lot or read the Bible consistently, you've probably heard of this miracle, at least in general. And it's because, as I mentioned, this is the second time Jesus has done this. The, 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 the well-known story is actually the first one in Mark chapter 6, where Jesus takes a little boy's five loaves and two fish and feeds a, a crowd of 5,000 men. And if you add families to that, it's probably more like 20,000 people. And so there's some overall similarities between the two stories. But it's important to understand that these aren't two versions of the same event. And this trips up a lot of people. There's a lot of skeptics that look at this story and say, see, this is why you can't trust the Bible. And they come up with all kinds of things, right? This is how you know that different people pulled the Gospel of Mark together, or, or this, is, this is why you can't trust the reliability of the Gospels. Or some people really stretch and they say, Mark, you know, just, this shows the human limitations of the Bible because Mark forgot that he already wrote it down. This is, this is scholarship, okay? But this is not two versions of the same event. In fact, you read in context. Most of your Bible answers will come if you read in context. Jesus clearly refers to them as two separate events later in Mark chapter 8, verse 19 and 20. These are not... Two di- these are two different historical events that happen at two different times in two different places with different details. And those differences are important for understanding what God is revealing through Mark's gospel. And we won't go through all the differences, but I want you to have confidence as you read scripture because if you compare the two stories, you actually notice different details. Like the crowds are a different size. The number of loaves and fish are are different. Amount of time is different. One day in the wilderness in Mark 6, three days in the wilderness in in Mark 8. Even the baskets are different. Like in the original language, in Mark 6, it's it's small baskets. They're basically lunch boxes, right? And in Mark chapter 8, it's actually a Greek word that refers to a large container. It's the same word that's used when the apostle Paul is lowered down out of a window. So these are big containers that a whole person can fit in. These are different details. Listen, there's so many other details. The point is this. It's very clear that these are two different events. But why? Why would Jesus do this same thing twice? This is where you got to lean in when you're reading the Bible. Why would Jesus do the same miracle twice? I want you to see this for yourself. This is key to what Jesus is inviting the disciples into. If you're reading through the Gospel of Mark, you'll notice that this theme of bread starts in chapter 6 and continues all the way through our passage here in Mark chapter 8. And that's intentional. I want you to see this. You go back to Mark chapter 6 for a minute. If you've got your own Bible, look at it in your own Bible. Like the flip back, Mark chapter 6, where Jesus is in Israel, which is Jewish territory. And he does this same miracle in Mark chapter 6, verse 41. It says, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate, and I love this, and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. So Jesus is in Israel, and he does this feeding miracle. And then you remember Mark chapter 7. 
David talked about this when he preached several weeks ago. Mark chapter 7, the Pharisees confront Jesus and they get into a theological debate with Jesus about who's considered clean and unclean. And the Pharisees said, well, you're unclean because of external stuff, like where you come from or, or, or the religious rituals that you go through. And Jesus says, actually, you're wrong. All y'all are unclean. Because what makes you unclean is the simple condition of your heart. And then Jesus leaves Galilee. He actually leaves Israel and goes into Gentile territory, halfway through chapter 7. Territory that the Jews saw as unclean, as defiled, as a place where the presence of God does not dwell. And that's where he meets the Syrophoenician woman that we talked about. You remember this Gentile woman who's begging Jesus to heal her daughter. And Jesus responds to her in Mark chapter 7, verse 27, and says, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Pause, Jesus. Listen, if you are not familiar, you weren't here when we studied that, I really can't help you that much. Right? You just got to go back and listen to the I know it's so you want to cancel Jesus. I know. You got to go back and listen to, to, to the message. But let me just give you the, the overview, right? Like th- this is how the Jews would talk about Gentiles as stray dogs, as filthy, unclean, unfit to even come in the house. And that's not what Jesus is doing here. What Jesus is doing is he's offering a parable, and a dog is a metaphor for somebody who who is in the house, but they don't necessarily have a seat at the table. In other words, at this point, it's this parable of Jesus saying the Gentiles aren't a part of God's covenant people yet. The Gentiles shouldn't expect to get anything from like a Jewish Messiah, it's this parable, it's this invitation to this woman. And then she responds in verse 28. She says, yes, Lord. Yet even, she's like, okay, you want to play parables? Okay, I'll, I'll take that. Yet even the dogs under the table eat, listen, eat the children's crumbs. She's saying, I know I'm a Gentile. I know I'm not a part of the covenant people of God. But she says, Jesus, I see enough goodness in you. I see enough compassion in you to believe that even though I don't deserve the bread on the table, I believe you're good enough and compassionate enough to at least give me a little bit of crumbs. And then look what happens in our passage. Jesus is in Gentile territory. He does the same miracle with bread again in Gentile territory. In Mark chapter 8, verse 8, and they, who? All of these Gentiles ate and were satisfied. Just as satisfied as the Jews were in Mark chapter 6. They ate to the point of being completely full, and they took up the broken pieces, left over seven baskets full, and there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. What in the world is happening? Why does Jesus do this miracle twice? It's intentional because the first time he did it for Jews and Israel, and this is his way of saying the blessings of the kingdom of God, the riches of the grace of God are also equally available to all people. To all people. And so listen, I wonder, I wonder if the Syrophoenician woman was in that crowd. I wonder if the woman who said, Jesus, I don't deserve bread, but would you just give me some crumbs? I wonder if she was in the crowd when Jesus and his people gave her enough bread to be satisfied. Because Jesus was revealing something about who he is and his mission, that he cares, he has compassion for our needs, but ultimately the deepest compassion that he feels in his heart is for our deepest need. The deepest human need is for us to be reconciled to God and to find eternal life in him. And that's why Jesus makes it so clear in John chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. 
Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus says, yes, I care about your temporary physical need. I'm going to slow down, and I'm going to serve that need. He says, but it is ultimately still pointing you to the fact that you need something to fulfill an eternal need. You need somebody to rescue you from the cycle of constantly trying to scrape the bottom of the barrel to satisfy your soul. You need somebody who can offer you what will ultimately lead you to never hunger or thirst again. And so listen, Jesus knew his ministry did not stop in that desolate place. He left that desolate place to go to another one. And in the Gospel of Mark, this is about where he begins to transition back to Israel, ultimately on his way to the cross. Because Jesus knew that broken bread wasn't enough, but that his body had to be broken. Broken bread can satisfy a temporary need, But his body had to be broken in order to satisfy that eternal need for us to be reconciled to God through the forgiveness of our sins. And I want you to see his compassion. I want you to see his commitment to serving your deepest need. Because when he was hungry in the wilderness, and Satan said to him, if you're God's son, turn these stones to bread, Jesus refused. Refused. The same power that he used to bless and serve this crowd he could have used for himself, and he refuses to do it because he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He says, I came in accordance with the Scriptures. My mission is to fulfill the promises of the Word of God, to bring salvation and redemption to all people. And in the same way, when he was in the garden, and he could have indulged himself, And he could have avoided the pain of the cross. He refused. He refused because he knew, he knew that he had to go to Jerusalem and be arrested and be dragged outside the city. He knew that he had come to allow his body to be beaten and to be bloodied. He knew that he came to be lifted up on the cross and crucified and to give his life as a sacrifice in our place for our sins. He knew that eternal life would only come as he was lowered into the grave and then risen again. Jesus knew that you watching today, that you sitting in this room today, he knew that every single one of us would need the bread of life. And I want you to hear that invitation from God. Because if you're here or you're watching and you're not yet a follower of Jesus, like that's the invitation that you need to really consider and think about. And there is something in your soul that knows that this world cannot fully satisfy you. You know it because you keep chasing the stuff and then you get it and you're not satisfied yet. And now you got to upgrade and now you got to level up. We know that we were not designed to be satisfied by the things of this world. And the problem is that you can't find that satisfaction anywhere. You can't even find it in God ultimately because your sin separates you from him just like my sin separated me from him. And God loved you so much that he sent Jesus, the son of God, to come and to take your place on the cross. He experienced the judgment that you deserve so that you could be forgiven and you could be reconciled to God and your soul could be fully satisfied, not just now, but for all of eternity. And his invitation for you today is stop delaying. Stop hiding behind your questions. Questions are legit. But, but surrender to God by saying, God, in the midst of my questions, I am trusting you. I've heard enough 
to know that I'm a sinner. I, I've heard enough to know that I don't deserve anything good from you, God. I can't live up to my own standards, much less your standards, God. There's no way for me to earn your goodness. And I've heard enough. I don't have all my questions answered, but I've heard enough to believe that what the Bible is teaching is true, that Jesus is exactly who he says he is. And I want to encourage you today to just take a moment between you and God right now and to just confess to him that you, you want his forgiveness. You want to be saved from your sin. You want the satisfaction that only comes from a relationship with him and to tell him, I am putting my trust, I am putting my whole life, God, in your hands on the basis of what Jesus has done for me. And for those of you who have put your trust in Jesus, how do you look at your life? You stay-at-home moms, how do you look at that? You teachers, how do you look at your classroom? Entrepreneurs and those in the military, like how do you look at what takes up so much of your days? As you think about people around you and far from you who have not heard or don't understand or have not yet trusted in the gospel, well, how do you think about that? Listen, who has God called you to minister to? Because he's called you to ministry, to serve people on behalf of Jesus, to serve people in a way that will hopefully, prayerfully, ultimately lead them to not just see, but to believe in the love of Jesus for them as demonstrated in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection. He's called you to ministry. You see your life that way. He's made you aware of a need. And yes, he has exposed your inadequacy. But he's invited you to give him what you already have. And then he will, and I know in so many ways he already is, working through you in a way that will glorify him, that will point people to his power and his love and his sufficiency, not yours. And listen, listen. If you would let, let your inadequacy keep you from this, you're missing the adventure. The adventure is being like, I'm inadequate. I don't know how I got put on this team, but I'm here. <laughs> the adventure is you stepping into a discipleship relationship with somebody and you like, I don't know how to help this person. <laughs> Addiction came up and marital problems came up. I don't, I don't know exactly, but I'm going I'm to I'm 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 lean on my, my coach in my church group. I'm going to lean on a pastor. I'm going to study God's word. I'm going to pray, and, and I'm just going to keep showing up, and I'm going to keep pouring in what God has already given me. And the adventure is seeing God do miracles in that person's life as he delivers them from addiction and as he causes them to grow up in maturity and as their marriage is reconciled or in the midst of their pain and struggle, you see a joy in them that they never experienced. The miracle is when you get to stand back and watch that person glorify God, but not just them, but you actually stand back and glorify God because you're like, God, I don't know how you did that through me, but I'm thankful. Man, I hope you'll experience that. I hope you will not sit on the sidelines in your life. I hope you will not just follow the pattern of this world that tells you to just keep hustling and keep grinding and just get another check and just whatever. I hope you will see your whole life differently, that God has you where he has you because he's called you to ministry. And I hope you'll get to experience the joy of being on that adventure with God. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you so much for your compassion. Lord, you see so much weakness in us, need in us, sin in us. And yet, your response is compassion. 
is to help us, is to solve the problem, to serve the need. I pray, Lord, that we would feel that now. We would feel your compassion toward us. I pray you would fill our hearts with just joy and peace knowing that that's how you feel when you see us in I pray for those, Lord, who have not yet put their trust in Jesus, Lord. I pray that you would pour out your compassion on them, Lord. I pray, God, that you would, literally, I pray that you would keep them alive long enough, God, to finally make the decision to put their trust in you. Please, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would work in their hearts, you would open their eyes to see how glorious and compassionate you are. You are holy. You are righteous and just. You are serious about sin. But God, thank you that in your compassion, you've given us an opportunity to turn, to repent, to trust in you. Lord, I pray, God, that many people would do that today. And Father, I pray, Lord, I pray, Father, for those burdens that you've given us, those needs that you've enabled us to see, Lord, I pray that you would give us clarity and give us wisdom. And God, would you give us courage, courage to step out in faith and to serve that person, to minister to those those people, Lord, to share the gospel in that moment of opportunity, God. Please increase our faith and work through us in a way that brings you glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.